Hello and welcome back to my channel and today I'm counting down the top 10 films of Carl Dreyer. Now if I was a teacher at a film studies class and a student came up to me and said look Mr Bartlett what are the films that I really need to see? I mean forget all these you know the films that I'm given to watch in my watch list and the films that are you know co politically correct or culturally correct you know what's the real nitty-gritty the core the inner sanctum of cinema what do I really need to watch what are the real best films I'd put my arm around their shoulder well I wouldn't put my arm around their shoulder because you can't do that these days but what I'd say is look between you and me don't tell anyone else this but there's five films you can watch and they're all by the same director Passion of Joan of Arc Vampire Day of Wrath Audet Gertrude watch those five films and you have seen cinema. Don't tell anyone else this. Everything else is a DVD bonus. It's an extra. Those five films are all you need to see. They are cinema. So there you have it. The secret is out, my friends. Those five films, now don't get me wrong, there are many, many directors and many films I love, as you'll know if you've watched this channel. But when it comes down to it, those five films are the core of the planet. They are the core of cinema. And each one of them, for me, represents a quantum leap forward in cinematic art when they came out. You know, the British critic Gilbert Adair was quite a wit, and he put it this way. He said, you know, some people excel in certain types of films. George Romero made horror films. John Ford made westerns. Carl Dreyer made greatest films ever made. That was his genre. And I think there's something in that. I think he's an extraordinary director. So good are his films, so powerful and enriching that they're actually quite difficult to talk about. I was quite intimidated making this video. How can we talk about why Dreyer is so great? Well, one of the things that you'll see in a lot of film criticism, rather lazy film criticism about Carl Dreyer, he's constantly compared to Ingmar Bergman. Why? Because they're both Scandinavian. That's a bit... It's a bit insulting, isn't it? A bit trite. I mean, for example, if you had a, a director just comparing two directors because they were black or black American, it would seem a bit trite when they're completely different directors trying to do completely different things. Dreyer and Bergman are only brought together because they happen to be white Scandinavian men, when actually they're very, very different directors. Bergman is primarily a psychological director. He's a sort of, ter like Manny Faber would call it, a termite, digging in to people's psychology, the psychology of couples, the psychology of men and women. He's also digging into the psychology of actors and how that psychology of the actor and the man and woman relates to the psychology of us, the spectator. He's a restlessly experimental artist who's always trying different ways to represent this on screen. Dreyer is the complete opposite. He is not a psychological director though there is a great deal of intelligent psychology in his films. And like Bergman, there's a great deal of cultural specificity. Bergman is, contrary to what many of his uh, detractors say, is interested in, in the world we're living in and how to portray it, the world of the atomic bomb, the world of the Vietnam War. So is Dreyer. But Dreyer wants to get away from that to something more timeless, more abstract, more fabulous. He's not interested in getting into the nitty gritty and sort of scurrying around like a mole like Bergman. He wants to come back and look at it, not with Olympian detachment, but with a sort of spiritual detachment, I would say, a calmness. There's a sort of, you know, abstract beauty in Dreyer, a becalmed feeling about it, unlike Bergman's more frenetic, hysterical activity. So they're two very different directors. They're approaching similar ideas. I mean, they both talk about God and the, the problem of coming into a 20th century where there is no God. The, you know, the problem of a 20th century with all its attendant ills, you know, war and totalitarianism. But they're coming at it from two completely different ways. You know, Bergman is an interior director going inside into our interior psychology. Dreyer wants to step back and look at it from a timeless perspective. That's one way we can start to look at how Dreyer works as a director. Let's get into the top ten and see if we can find some others. Now, my tenth placed film is Bride of Glomdal. 
This is one of his early silent films from the 1920s. It's not a particularly distinguished film. It's a kind of classic folklore tale, you know, of a boy who falls in love with a girl, but her father has promised her to another man. Um, you know, it was filmed completely in Norway, and it's most notable for its beautiful Norwegian backdrops. The photography is stunning. Um, and that's really its major selling point. The story is fairly straightforward. It leads to a great climax around this gushing rapids of this river. But, you know, it's fairly basic stuff, but it's just beautifully filmed. And it's interesting to watch Dreyer at an early stage of his filmmaking, you know, honing his craft. Similarly, in ninth place, another silent film, Michael. Now, this is rather glibly in the modern era called his gay film, which I think is a rather glib, rather crude way of what is actually a very complex, moving and subtle relationship or series of relationships that are explored in the film. It is a film that in 1924 deals with a homosexual relationship in an extraordinarily sensitive and intelligent way. It's about the relationship between uh, a, a sort of master painter and his pupil. There's a kind of like a star is born thing going on here where as the pupil ascends, the, the master goes down, you know, it's that kind of thing. And there's an interesting play in this film where everyone moves into something that they're not initially supposed to be interested in. So the young man's movement goes from art towards infatuation and sexual infatuation with this princess. The, you know, the, the man moves, the master painter moves towards a more spiritual understanding of himself because of his loss of status, etc, etc. So it's a very subtle film for its time, again a silent film, very beautifully shot. And again it shows Dreyer becoming a master of his craft. In eighth place is Master of the House. Now, this is arguably the most important pre-Passion of Joan of Arc film in terms of the development of Dreyer's craft. It's a camera It's almost all set in an interior of this house, this sort of middle-class house, where the father is a bit of a tyrant and tyrannises his wife and family. And his ex-nanny, who lives with them, decides to take control of this situation. She sends the wife off to the mother, <coughs> to her mother, and she takes control of the house. And basically, this father figure starts to realise that he's, he's been wrong and he's got to mend his ways. So the nanny becomes the master of the house sort of thing. It's a kind of showman geiki. You know, Ozu over in Japan would make a whole, you know, lifetime of making these films, examining the family. And this is a kind of... It's a kind of Scandinavian showman geiki, really. It's very, pu it's very beautiful, it's very cute, but it also shows Dreyer's growing brilliance at just making a beautifully crafted and very moving film, simply from interiors, character movements, the, the reality and the, the realism of the actor's performances, that this becomes the stuff of his cinema. And it's, a, it's, um, it's perhaps not his most moving or fun early silent film, but it's an extremely important film in the steps to becoming the great director that he would become. Now, in seventh place, a bit of a guilty pleasure. You see, all directors, you know, even the most famous directors, they've got to make a living, they've got to make a buck. They can't just be sitting there making great art all the time. Dreyer had to make a living. And one of the things he did was he made adverts and he also made uh, public information films. And in the late 30s, he made a film called They Caught the Ferry, which you can find on YouTube on Daily Motion, and on Daily Motion. I'll try and leave a link for you. And it's about road safety. It's about not driving fast on the roads. And it, it's this couple, they come to this island um, off the coast of Denmark, and they need to make the ferry on the other, co other side of the coast. So they get on their motorbike and they're blasting down these country lanes. Oh, but little do they know that they're going to tangle with this little truck going along at about 30 miles an hour. And driving the truck is a man who looks suspiciously like death. And of course they'll come to no good. And the ferry that will take them off the island is the ferry crossing the river to Hades. It's all very silly. It's, it's a, like a little 11 minute short on the perils of road safety. But it just shows how a great director can take simple material 
and make something really fun and memorable out of it. It's like Carl Dreher does Spielberg's Duel, you know, racing this, you know, <laughs> this truck, this force of nature, this force of death. It's great fun. Now, my personal favourite of the early silent films, the pre Passion of Joan of Arc films, is uh, his second film, The Parson's Widow. This is not thought of as a particularly great movie, but I happen to like it a lot. It's a sweet little folkloric story like Bride of Glomdal, um, and it's set in a village in the past. And the local parson, a young parson, comes to this village to take over the job from the other parson who's just died. But part of the job description is he, he has to marry the parson's widow, even though she's much older than him, and even though he's already engaged to someone else. And it's a sort of very gentle kind of comedy uh, set in this beautifully recreated world of, you know, old sort of 1800s, I think, uh, Denmark. I'm not quite sure of the date, but it's a sort of timeless world anyway, you know, the timeless rural village. And it's very sweet and it's very beautifully filmed. I love the, the interiors and the exteriors, these lovely wooden houses in this kind of charming Scandinavian landscape. It just tickles me. I suppose it's not the most, you know, developed or extraordinary of Dreyer's films, but I'm very, very fond of it. OK, now, that's the prologue. Now we come to the five great Dreyer films, the films that I think are the core of all world cinema. At number five, I could put these in any order. It's a bit of an arbitrary order. I'm going to put Day of Wrath. Now, this is the film that he made during the Second World War, as most of Northern Europe was occupied by the Nazis. And many people have drawn parallels between this film and the Nazi occupation. It's a film about witch trials, and it's still to this day, I, I'm, very, I'm very interested in witchcraft, I'm very interested in that genre, it's still the most powerful. And it's about how the witch trials come to this village, and the parson of this village has married a much younger woman, a younger woman whose passions are starting to inflame inside her, and she's being drawn to other men, and she's going to get caught up in these witch trials, in this hysteria. To this day, the, the um, torture of the older woman who's thought to be a witch in the village is still genuinely shocking. You know, she's naked in front of all these men being, you know, horribly treated. But what is exciting about this film, it's not just a powerful humanist statement about resistance and about the truth and complexity of human psychology under a very strict and horrible regime, though it is brilliant. It's also that Dreyer finds excitement in just the movement of a person across a room. This is a film where a young woman trots lightly across a room and it's like, it's like there's been a tsunami. It's extraordinary how Dreyer can just take the movement of actors and with precise shadow and light, precise composition, can make it an event. This is a film where the sort of the power of the regime is often done through processions of people moving through a church, young boys in a choir line moving through a church, or the way a group of men are positioned around a vulnerable woman who's being tortured. You know, how just the, the, the portrait of a young woman's face in a glass with bars on the glass can become such a powerful, iconic image. The woman is not, a, is not an innocent victim. You know, she has her own desires, and that puts her in danger. And Dreyer explores this completely cinematically. So that, for example, going back to those choir boys lined up against the wall in a procession, they represent the order, the system of the society. When the woman comes in, the young woman comes in, she's moving independently of them. She's therefore seen as a disruptive, subversive force, but also someone who is a potential victim because she's an outsider. And this is the whole nature of Dreyer's film, is using camera and actors' movements to show you the relative position of these people relative to their society, relative to authority. It's so brilliantly and powerfully done. I don't think any director has done it so well in the history of film. Let's talk about the fourth film now. Gertrude. Now, Gertrude, we have to have a little chat about Gertrude. Gertrude, for the longest time, 
was my Holy Grail film. Now, what do I mean by my Holy Grail film? Well, when I was a young cinephile, learning about movies and reading about all the important filmmakers and all the important films, I read about Gertrude. And what excited me about Gertrude was for serious cinephile critics, when this film had come out in 1964, Dreyer had not made a film for over 10 years. He was a dinosaur. It was shown at the Cannes Film Festival and it completely divided the critics. There's something so exciting about that, isn't there? A lot of people booed and walked out. They thought, what the hell is this? And they left. And then a hardy group of people championed it and defended it. And when I started getting into film in the late 90s, Gertrude still had the flavour of this reputation. It was a cult film for really serious cinephiles. So I thought, oh, this is the Holy Grail. If I watch Gertrude and I like Gertrude, I'm there, man. I'm in the Masonic club of people who know their film. You know, I'm, I'm one of the, you know, the, you know, the highbrow kids. So I wanted to watch Gertrude. Finally, there was a drier season at the British Film Institute in London. It was my chance. Here we go. I'm going to watch Gertrude. So on the night, I'm on the tube to go to, into town. The tube breaks down. Bloody tube. And I get there a bit late. I run in. At that time, the BFI used to do this ridiculous system where what they did was they didn't do subtitles on the screen. The subtitles, you had a pair of headphones and there was some guy up in the projection booth speaking as the people were speaking on screen. So you had some guy going, yes, mother, that's right, okay, yeah. Like, it was so, like this dead person just not speaking the lines very well. Anyway. So I got in, it was already dark, the film had already started, I was playing around with the headphones, trying to get the headphones on right, and then finally I could sit and watch Gertrude, and I was all flustered. I sat and I watched the whole film, and I didn't fall asleep once, yes, and then I, I realised that I'd really enjoyed it, and I thought, I'm there, I'm inside, I'm in the inner sanctum of cinephilia. So that's just, a, I just want to tell you that story, to give you an idea of this, the status this film enjoyed. It's Dreyer's most difficult film. Now, I say it's his most difficult film, but really it's his most simple. It's his most pure. It's a very simple story. Again, a Kammerspieler based on a, a, an early 20th century play, and it's very theatrical, and Dreyer points up the theatricality. He doesn't move away from it at all. And it's simply about this woman. She's an upper-middle-class woman, a society woman, in a rather loveless marriage. She loves her husband, but that you know, it's dimming. She has lovers, particularly a young lover who's obviously a cad and a bounder. And what she finds is that all the men in her life cannot give her what she's looking for, which is love. Love with a capital L. Love that is uncompromising, that is not tainted by their career or their other desires or society. Pure love. And in the end, she rejects all of them for a life of loneliness. And it's very simple, that's all it is. So in a way, it's his most simple film, it's the most pure film. And that's what makes it his most difficult, right? Because it's moving towards a pure abstraction, right? Where this woman almost is beautiful in, in her pursuit just of pure love, but it's also sort of almost kind of monstrous because she won't compromise for those problems, those frailties of the human condition. All the way through this film, you cannot help asking yourself, what's Dreyer doing here? There he was in the 1960s in the height of the Nouveau Vague, and he makes this deliberately, incredibly old-fashioned, creaky film, which has all the hallmarks of an adaptation of a stage play from the 1900s. And he makes it deliberately awkward. The film starts, it has this very sort of solemn, you know, title card. And then it starts with the actor playing the husband, we're looking into the set, he's there, and he walks forward at an angle into the screen, sort of diagonally, and then moves across. It's such an unnatural movement. And it's such a theatrical movement, it's, it's, it seems so fake. Why has Dreyer done this? Whenever I watch the film, I'm asking myself these questions while I'm getting involved in the drama. In another scene, where she's talking to an ex-lover, he's perched on the arm of a sofa, very awkwardly, you know, you think, oh, that must be a bit uncomfortable for him. While well, he's having this extremely important discussion with the woman he's loved for years. All the way through this strange 
discomfort of this film. It's almost as though Dreyer is deliberately putting you in an uncomfortable position. The performances are not in any way melodramatic. They're toned down, almost somnambulist. It's an extraordinary film, and yet the power of it. At the end, the final scene, where the door closes on her on, in her solitude, it's, it destroys you. Where has that emotion come from? Just watching this upper-middle-class person in sort of 1900s Denmark, chatting to her lovers, you know, living this kind of cosy, privileged life. But the, but the, the sort of subterranean build-up of emotion and power, this sense of an uncompromising will for love, it's like it comes out of nowhere. And you, you, you can't help it, you're kind of watching the film thinking, well, where does it come from? How did Dry produce this? And you can never quite find the answer. And that's why the film is so fascinating and why it's so beautiful and why it has become a cult object for so many cinephiles. I urge people to watch Gertrude. Watch the other Dreyer films first. You won't be prepared for it otherwise. But once you've watched Dreyer's other films, watch Gertrude. It's extraordinary. Now, at number three, I'm going to put uh, Dreyer's most famous film, The Passion of Joan of Arc, which is regularly voted one of the ten best films of all time, as it should be. It is absolutely extraordinary. This is, of course, about Joan of Arc and the trials she underwent at the hands of the British um, in the medieval times and the wars with France. And this film, there is film before Passion of Joan of Arc and there is film afterwards. When I first saw this film, I'd seen a lot of silent films, and up to Passion of Joan of Arc, silent cinema produced many masterpieces, many sophisticated, beautifully made films. But when you watch Passion of Joan of Arc, something has shifted. I can't explain it, it's very difficult to put into words, but you think, my God, this film has, this film has come forward. It, it, it's come from nowhere. It doesn't have any antecedents. And it's shifted us forward a quantum leap. You know, there's no going back now. What's odd about that is it's a film that's it's medieval in its, in its storyline and it looks back in its compositions to Gothic art, yet somehow it is deeply modern. Where does that modernity come from? It comes from two places, really. First of all, it comes from Maria Falconetti and her extraordinary performance. She was a brilliant stage actress who Dreyer picked out. She wasn't very keen on making the film. But she did it, and she only gave one performance in cinema, and it is one of the greatest performances in film. And part of the greatness of her performance is how she works with Dreyer and his cinematographer. This is a film that really discovered the spiritual power of the close-up and what you can do with the close-up. You know, Falconetti didn't wear makeup, so we are confronted with just the natural face and the emotions that run across it. And I know that people will laugh at this. It's a bit of a strong way of putting it. But, you know, there are close-ups, like Marlene Dietrich's close-ups in Sternberg's films, like Shanghai Express, where you're just invited to look at beauty. There are close-ups that stir us because they're so beautiful, or they, they make us, you know, they, they bring us close to this beautiful man or woman. The close-ups of Maria Falconetti, you feel you can see into her soul. I know that that's very hyperbolic spiritual language but I really feel that when she's surrounded by these men these soldiers and priests torturing her she's her, she's crying she's desperate but she's still got the faith you really connect with her on a very spiritual and very powerful level I don't think many other films have done that and that's a combination of Dreyer's intensity as a director and Falconetta's intensity as an actor it is extraordinary. There's nothing else quite like it. It's still one of the great films. I mean, it builds up to her, you know, dying at the stake. Horrendous. You know, Dreyer shows that with real realism, really powerful realism. And, and you know, the crowd revolting against the soldiers around her. I, I defy anyone not to be moved by this film. But if you're going to discover it for the first time, I want to make a request, please. And that is, watch it silent. Turn the sound off. 
There are so many versions of Passion of John that don't be available. Lots of them with modern scores. I saw one with this awful modern choral score, which drained all the energy from the film. It was so in love with its own self that it sort of didn't really complement the film. The fact is that when you're alone with Maria Falconetti in her face, you don't need music. Music ruins it. Turn the sound off, right? You know, I watch a lot of silent films silent. You know, I mean, people are just queuing up to have a video night with me. It's great fun around my house. But no, but seriously, um, if you watch it, just her movements of her face, her eyes, the tears that you can see rolling down her face for real, just the, the, the movements of her, her eyes and her facial expressions, that's all the music you need. You don't need any other music. Just watch it silent. You'll thank me for it. You will have one of the greatest experiences watching a film you've ever seen. Now, second place is a film I've discussed on this channel many times before, and I'll give you a link to the video in which I discuss this film in depth. And that is Carl Dreyer's Vampire. Now, some people might think it's strange that I've put a horror film above three masterpieces like Passion of Joan of Arc, Gertrude and Day of Wrath. The reason I do is because, I'm not saying this film is better than those films, but this is one of the five or six most important films for me in teaching me how cinema works. Why? The reason, it's based on Camilla, the short story by Sheridan Le Fanu about a female vampire. And it's a, in, term, in narrative terms, it's barely a narrative film at all. It's just about a, a young man experiencing weird phenomena and trying to save this uh, young girl from a vampire. Really, it's a tone poem, a poem of the uncanny. All that Dreyer is interested in doing is using cinematic means to convey the uncanny, the supernatural. And in that, it is a masterclass and something genuinely haunting. Dreyer said in an interview about what he was trying to do in this film, and he said, imagine you go into a living room, just an ordinary living room, and then someone says to you, behind the sofa, there's a dead body. Immediately the room changes. The whole atmosphere changes. The way you see it changes, even though nothing has changed. That is cinema. How can you take plastic elements, light, set, sound, and through those plastic elements convey the unusual, the supernatural, the unreal. And the way that Dreyer goes about this is extraordinary. So he has, he uses shadow. So for example, a man with one, one leg and a wooden leg hobbles along with his shadow back projected, but then the shadow keeps moving on its own. We see in the night which is all transmitted through a white gauze over the screen. So not darkness and shadows, but sort of this kind of eternal whiteness that's a really ghostly effect. And we see another shadow of a man digging a grave, but backwards. These are the simple techniques that Dreyer uses. He also does simple things like people walking, like there's a girl who's been affected by the vampire, she's lying down, a nurse treats her, then she walks towards the camera and behind it, then comes back the other side. That breaks all the rules. It makes us feel uncomfortable, right? That breaks all the rules of proper filmmaking. That's what Dry wants to do. He wants to put us in a zone where we don't feel comfortable. I've talked about this in another video, how there's a particular shot in this film which I just cannot get round. It's incredible. And it's a very simple bridging shot in the narrative. A young girl has been attacked by the vampire out in the grounds of the house. Two servants bring her in, right? Watched by the hero of the film. The two servants are bringing in the girl, and here is the corridor of the house. The camera starts at the end of the corridor and starts pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. The girl and the servants come in here, so the camera is here, and they come in. The camera is still pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. Then they walk down, up a staircase, and only then do you see the hero of the film watching at the corner of the screen here. Why did Dreyer film it that way? To this day, I, don't, I can't really explain it, but I know how brilliant it is and how unsettling it is. And that's just a simple bridging shot in the film. 
no other film has really unsettled me and made me think about how you can use cinema than this film. It's just extraordinary. And there's so many incredible iconic images, like the doctor at the end dying in a flour mill, drowning in whiteness, not in murky water, but in whiteness, in white flour. And you see his glasses slowly being drowned in flour. An extraordinary image. If you've never seen Vampire, don't go in expecting a traditional horror film. You'll be very disappointed, right? It, but if you go in expecting a sort of poem of the uncanny, like something written by Poe, translated onto screen, you will have an extraordinary experience. But my number one Carl Dreyer film is Audette, sometimes known in English-speaking circles as The Word. Why is this film so incredibly powerful? It's a simple, again, you know, large elements of Kammerspieler set in this rural home in northern Denmark, a farming family. And this is a film that centres around a death. A young mother in the family dies. And a lot of the film is about how the family react to this death. Now, many people say that all death, it's called the word, right? Pete say it's a film about faith. And one of the central characters is the eldest son of this family who has had a breakdown and now believes he's Jesus Christ and delivers sermons from the mount on, in the local landscape. And a lot of people think this is, you know, a lot of people see Dreyer as a, a, a faith filmmaker and that this is his ultimate film about faith. But I think it's actually more productive to think about this film as a film about death. I think this is the ultimate film about death, that subject, that certainty for all of us, and how it affects us and how we deal with it. And this builds to the final scene. Now, if you've never seen this film, please switch off this video now, because I don't want to ruin it for you. And the final scene is, I think, the greatest final scene in film. So I don't want to ruin it. But basically what happens is, the young mother is laid out in a coffin, and the, they're coming to the funeral, the family surround her in this beautiful white space. And the eldest son, who thinks he's Jesus Christ, says, I can raise her from the dead. And only the young child, the young daughter of the family, believes him. But her childish faith pushes the idea through. And then what you see, you see the woman laid out in the coffin very still, and suddenly her arm just moves. I cannot tell you. Even thinking about it now, I'm choking up. It's such a powerful moment. One of the great movements on camera. And she wakes. And what is so powerful and so moving, this has been a film, that, like the paterfamilias, the older paterfamilias, how he deals with death and his guilt about this woman's death. And then her husband and how he deals with it. And his, his feelings about her are far more visceral because she's his wife, she's his physical companion as well as his spiritual companion. And when she, when she rises from the dead, his relief and joy and the way he embraces her and kisses her is so powerful. But you see, a lot of people, I think, just see this as a film about a miracle. And God knows it's been repeated endlessly in very poor European art house films. You know, the idea of using the miracle as something subversive, that's become a trope in many very poor European art house films, and also in the dreadful film Silent Light by Colas Regadas, which completely nicks this final scene of Audette. But it's not just a miracle. You have to look at what happens after she rises from the dead. She embraces her husband, she's crying, and then she asks about the child she lost. She died in childbirth. And she says, but what about my child? And he's so relieved, he doesn't register her despair. And says, oh, he's, he's dead, but we're alive, we're alive. And she tearfully says, life. And that is the final word of the film. The pain of life. As well as its beauty. I don't think any other scene, any other film has dealt with death. And our relationship to it so powerfully. The last time I saw this film, I was blubbing like a baby. I don't think any film moves me so much. I mean, I, 
I'm sort of choking up just talking about it, actually. It's so powerful, so moving. And again, all of Drea's brilliance as a filmmaker is in this film. Again, it's the movement of people in the room. It becomes like an earthquake. And, and, and once you become attuned to that, just the, 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 the intense detail of this fable, then you, you start to really understand Dreyer's greatness as a filmmaker. I, I, I can't talk about this film highly enough. It's a film that you must experience. It's very slow. Um, it's very deliberate. It's not very modern in that sense. But do stick with it if you have the patience. It is the most moving experience in cinema. Okay, well, I hope I've articulated reasonably well why I like these films so much. They are so brilliant, like all great works of art. You can never really properly articulate why they're so good. There's always, in all great works of art, there's 10% that you can't quite get to. You try and you just end up saying woolly nonsense. And I suppose I've done this in this video. I love these five films that I've just talked about so much, so passionately. I could devote 10 videos to each of them and still not get close to why they're so amazing. I hope you discover them. As always, if you like my content, please like and subscribe.